Intel for Digital Inclusion in TA Discovery Project. Uh, my name is Genta. I'm the Delivery Lead for Digital Innovation here at Lotti. Um, and again, like I said, really, really good to see so many of you uh, in the virtual room. We'd love to know who, who's joined us today, so please do take the time to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, in terms of um, agenda for today, we've um, got a packed one, so uh, we'll spend the first half of the session actually sharing details of the project and some initial findings. Uh, after that, you'll have the opportunity to kind of contribute and ask us questions. Uh, but in the meantime, if I could ask you to put any questions you have in the chat and then we will return to those at the end of the session. Um, a little bit, um, a little bit more about the project, I guess, before we dive into the detail. Um, so this project is part of the Digital Inclusion Innovation Programme, which is a two year programme led by Lotti and funded by the GNA. And what we're doing is to work with borrowers and private and public sector partners to design and test innovative methods and approaches for tackling digital exclusion in London. Yeah, I just want to see if there's a weird buzzing noise coming from. I just want to see if it's coming from your computer or not. We can't. It may be, I'm afraid, but um, I can't solve it. I think it's the design of the um, of the device I'm using, unfortunately. Oh, okay. So I apologise in advance for that. Um, as I was saying, in terms of why we are working on this project, uh, it was essentially based on some early engagement uh, with Paris, where we actually became aware that residents living in all forms of temporary accommodation experience a range of barriers to getting online, you know, be it uh, because of lack of Wi-Fi in hostels, lack of devices, etc. But I think we decided to narrow down our focus to TA hostels um, for PACE. Uh, and to ensure that any future projects are actually informed by deep insights and an evidence base of what those exact barriers and issues are. Um, we'd also like to, you know, rapidly test this, this hypothesis of uh, whether the lack of Wi-Fi in hostels is a major contributing factor to digital exclusion of uh, residents living in temporary accommodation hostels. And then lastly, but definitely not leastly, we'd also like to build a deep understanding of the circumstances and nature of digital uh, needs of um, of people living in TA, and that's where the team for FutureGov from FutureGov come in. Um, we've commissioned them to undertake this very deep user research with para temporary accommodation leads, hostel managers, and residents living in temporary accommodation hostels. It's a very rapid eight-week project and a very focused piece of work. So um, I apologise for the slides, uh, but what we are hoping to do is at the end of it to have this uh, kind of um, involve all the relevant stakeholders and ha um, have that kind of deep and detailed discovery uh, about the factors that lead to digital exclusion in hostels and what sets of interventions might help. We just to bear in mind, I think that we're only a couple of weeks into this eight week discovery. Um, so today we'll share some very early findings with you. Um, but we also want to take this opportunity to actually get your feedback uh, and capture some of your experiences. Without further ado, I think I will hand over to the rest of the team to introduce themselves, starting perhaps with Sophie. Thanks, Kenta. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sophie Nelson. Um, I'm Digital Inclusion Projects Manager at LOTI. Um, so just helping with the delivery of all of the projects that fall within our Digital Inclusion Innovation Programme, which obviously includes this discovery. Um, let me pass over to Rachel to start the future Gov introductions. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Rachel Kelly. I am what we call a principal consultant, which essentially means I keep the strategic overview of this on behalf of FutureGov, making sure that we turn, we're able to turn the insights uh, into the uh, usable recommendations. Um, I will hand over to Courtney. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Courtney. I'm the delivery manager at FutureGov and basically just working with the team to ensure that we're able to get uh, the most done in the eight weeks that we've got. So just been helping with setting up all the hostel interviews and things like that and just making sure that we get in in touch with the right people. Um, I'll hand over to Gillian, who is our design researcher. Hi there, uh, my name is Jillian. I am one of the lead design researchers on the project, which means 
that I am primarily doing a lot of the on the ground work of actually talking to council members, hostel managers, and uh, people living in hostels as well. So I'll be going over a lot of our early findings um, from the work that we've uh, already kicked off. Um, and Hannah's not on the call today, but she is also um, joining me on, uh, on conducting that research as well. Um, I'll hand over briefly as well to Tristan. I know you're on the call, so uh, if you want to introduce yourself and uh, your role in the project, that would be great as well. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Tristan, I guess I'm a subject matter expert, so uh, I have over 15 years experience on working these type, types of projects on from every dimension, um, particularly from a, a, a policy perspective, um, uh, working with government on some of the interventions on this. but also led various organisations on this, so um, very excited to be part of this and um, helping to navigate our way to um, some really tangible recommendations. I think we've interviewed it. I think, I think that, is that everybody? Is there anybody left? I think that is everybody. That's yeah. all. Um, and I think I am actually next as well, so perfect. Yeah, I'm going to go over what we've done so far. Um, yeah, perfect. Thanks, uh, Genta. So, um, so far we have uh, started our initial commissioner and council staff interviews. So the way that we've set up the project is it is um, in a sense a multi-layered project. So uh, as Genta mentioned, uh, we're trying to speak to six boroughs all together uh, and get an understanding of uh, what their hostel setup is in each of those different councils. Um, and visit a council or a hostel in each one of those councils as well. Um, the reason that we're also conducting interviews uh, across kind of council level and within hostels is we want a bit of a layered approach as well. So we want to understand what hostel provision and hostel management looks like from that commissioner and council level, uh, what management looks like or hostel perspective looks like and digital inclusion looks like from a hostel management perspective as well. So staff and managers working within the hostels. And then um, finally, we actually want to understand what the lived experience of people living in hostels is in terms of digital inclusion. So uh, we've started by... Uh, oh, wow. so, oh, I don't know. Oh, I think someone's not on mute. Oh, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Would you, would everyone mind putting themselves on mute? Thank you. Um, so we started by talking to council staff uh, in six boroughs. Um, and what we wanted to do was gain a deeper understanding of hostel provision within their borough, uh, which clients they were working with. So some hostels um, or some councils have um, provisioners, third party provisioners, some do not. So we wanted to get an understanding of that. Um, and also the residents that they're working with as well. Uh, what that current uh, actual kind of digital connectivity looked like within hostels within their boroughs, um, the relationship between hostels uh, and council, and then any key challenges and barriers for them and the key challenges and barriers around what they're hearing from hostel level. So the boroughs currently involved are uh, Waltham Forest, uh, the Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea, Camden, Kingston, Redbridge, and then we're currently trying to identify one other. Um, we wanted to get a good spread of councils that were in central London and councils that were um, kind of on the outer spread of London as well to see if there are un any differences between that. Um, and then we're also trying to get a good spread of um, clients that are within hostels as well. So whether that be family, people with high level needs, people coming just out of rough sleeping, um, like a various people who are single. So a various kind of range of perspectives and lived experiences. Uh, if you could go on to the next slide, Ginta. Great, thank you. So our hostel manager interviews, um, we've currently gone into two hostels this week, one in Camden and one in uh, Waltham Forest. And there we started off by speaking to um, hostel managers, sitting down with them for, um, for a, about one hour, 45 minutes to one hour. And what we were trying to get an understanding from in their perspective um, is uh, the context of people living in hostel, their digital usage, 
um, the challenges and barriers that both hostel managers and residents or clients face in terms of digital usage in hostels. And then also just identifying, um, well, so we started off by having an initial discussion to identify uh, a list of hostels within boroughs that we could contact for interviews. So we've actually spoken to five hostel, four or five hostel managers so far um, on the phone or over video call, um, and then actually literally physically gone into two, two of those hostels where we spoke to both on the ground hostel managers and then also key workers where, um, where they were available as well. Uh, and then our hostel interviews. So as I mentioned, we've been into two so far. So Camden and Waltham Forest. Next week, we are visiting Kingston and Kensington and Chelsea. Um, there, we spoke to a variety of different clients or residents living in hostels. Um, and with uh, the residents, we were trying to understand the lived experience of of themselves uh, actually living in temporary accommodation from that and specifically get that kind of digital perspective as well. Um, what any of their everyday and kind of higher level longer term needs are, um, what their current digital usage looked like, what, what barriers they tended to face, and then how digital tools can assist them with their needs. And uh, next, I'm going to go through some of the, uh, we say insights, I just, I really want to um, to caveat that, um, that what we're going to address today is very, very high level findings and observations. Um, so uh, we, what we've done, we haven't an analyzed this data yet. We've literally just gone into hostels, and this is kind of what we've been discovering as we go. And then what we will do with that data is sit down with it and actually analyze and synthesize it on a, on a more in-depth level to understand what the patterns are. But what we wanted to share with you today is just a very, very high level brief oversight of some of the kind of early signals or early findings that, um, that we've identified as as and when we've been been doing this research as we go. Uh, so we'll hand over to to Rachel to just briefly go over some of the things that we've d identified within our council and commissioner interviews. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I'm just I, I'm not probably not going to go through each and every one of these. Um, and we I phrase these as questions, recognizing that these are council level and that that then helps us inform you know, the series of interviews that we have had with councils. And I think we've done all of all six now, um, but that e each conversation lays a different iteration on top of each conversation. And so very much open conversations, depending on where people wanted to take it. And, and, and it's been incredibly interesting and insightful so some of the things that have come up through those conversations are and i know i think uh jillian you're going to go into you're going to go into this in a bit more detail but yeah hostels are difficult to define and you, you know we can end up in a bit of a cul-de-sac of well what's a hostel and what's uh you know and, and what is private rented sector type stuff and each council approaches and provides hostels and temporary accommodation in different ways and it's quite difficult to sort of draw a ring fence around what hostels is um, and so there is something around uh, our thinking about does you know, how does that play through into the recommendations once, once, once we get to that point. Um, something else that we have been exploring is does a different model of either commissioned or in-house, what does that play through in terms of where conversations focus on digital exclusion? And some early hypothesis is that it may be easier for commissioners to have those conversations with providers, that that that, that provider model, than perhaps where it is in-house, where also managers are responsible for the quality of provision, et cetera. It becomes, a, it, it's a different focus for councils. That's a high level hypothesis, but I think that, that definitely plays through, that will play through as we get a bit deeper into this research and thinking about well, what is significant and, and therefore what, what might some of the solutions be. And something else that we want to understand a little bit more is the extent to which focus is place-based. So 
Wi-Fi provision, digital exclusion within individual buildings and making sure that making sure that things are in place, as opposed to thinking about individuals on their pathway or as they transition from different types of accommodation. And does that have an impact on the outcome that's achieved? Um, and I think that's that, you know, I think that was certainly quite came through quite strongly in my last interview and, and, and it's something that we will explore further. Um, some questions around the digital capabilities and skills of staff as well and recognizing that changes from place to place and from hostel and building to building but whether or not staff are enabled have the skills to talk and support members of to tenants clients residents um and I think another nuance of that is the extent to which they are digitally included themselves. So do they, do staff themselves within hostels have either the infrastructure, the technology, et cetera, or their own skills in order to be digitally included themselves? And does that play through in terms of outcomes for residents? Um, we also explored whether, you know, what what is the focus for boroughs? What is the main thing that people are talking about? Is it Wi-Fi? Or, or actually are other things popping up in prominence. I think to date, Wi-Fi does seem to be the number one issue at a council level, uh, although there has been some work around devices and availability of devices. But um, so, so that's an interesting dynamic. And then something else also worth exploring and, and in identifying our hostels, we've looked for different types of buildings, is that there is something around not just the availability of Wi-Fi, but also the shape of buildings. Um, so even where there is work to input Wi-Fi into all areas, not just communal areas, actually thick walls, et cetera, uh, size, the, you know, the height of the building, uh, the geographical place of the building can often be barriers. And so something around, even if you can take a whole borough approach to this, you need to be thinking about the nuances of each and every building. Hi, could I elaborate on that if that's cool? Go for it. Um, yeah, so like I feel um, especially, yeah, that's important, like the size, because I feel um, most of the hostels, they are really small. And I feel it's important that um, they could be like, like a studio type setting where you have everything that is just yours, like your own kitchen and bathroom, because in a hostel, it can be hard sharing with others. Fab, great. We're going to have an opportunity at the end for because we're really, really interested in exactly those sorts of insights. And so we've got an activity at the end of this after you become bored of listening to us talk at you um, to, to build those sorts of insights. So that, yeah, that, that's quite helpful. I'm going to end there on my bit and hand back to Gillian. Who's got much more because Dylan has actually been speaking directly with residents and that's what actually everyone's really interested in. So. <laughs> Um, no, I thought that was really interesting as well. And yeah, as Rachel mentioned, uh, after we've kind of thrown all of this information at you, um, we're going to have a session at the end uh, where you can throw in all of your comments and responses. So please feel free to write things in the chat or wait, uh, try to hold off and um, throw things at us at that point. Um, so one of the early findings, as uh, Rachel's always already mentioned, is as as and when we've been talking to various councils and even when we were going into councils this week, we really, really it just became very, very stark to us that like temporary accommodation hostels mean very, very different things to different councils. Um, so, for example, when we went to Camden, Camden's into uh, adult pathway. Uh, meant that their hostels um, were much more assisted. They had key workers on site. They had key workers who were having regular updates with uh, hostel residents um, on a practically daily basis. Um, and and a lot of hostel residents there uh, were um, relying on those key workers to help them do online things on a daily basis. Whereas when we went into Waltham Forest, Waltham Forest, um, their hostels um, were much more self-service. That doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have assisted living. It's just that they don't term their a hostel to be assisted living. They're different things. 
Um, so their hostels were self-service flats, no communal area, um, uh, and also uh, their staff were responsible for the, kind of the maintenance, health, and safety of the building. That didn't necessarily mean that the building manager didn't see them on a regular basis, but key workers were council provided and off site and they did not have um, uh, regular day-to-day uh, -day kind of interactions with residents living in hostels. Um, so they were much, much more independent. So what does that mean for us? I think one of the things that we need to consider, which is at, as Rachel kind of mentioned, um, how might we work together to recognize what those common challenges are when there are such different um, definitions between councils and um, and the question that we have for 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 anyone working within councils is how do you manage these differences and find commonalities within your own borough or across borough as well I think that's going to be one of the the kind of key things that we need to address or the one of the key challenges that we need to address going forward in this project. Next slide, please, Genta. So one of our other early findings is that um, residents might digitally be able to do something. Um, so they don't necessarily always lack digital confidence, um, but they're concerned that the system won't help them achieve what they need. So the more high stakes the task, the more likely residents are going to want the support of a key worker, a hostel manager, or kind of someone official to increase their perceived chances of success. So that might um, that might vary on on what that person's digital confidence was, um, but we we did find it kind of regularly throughout our um, throughout our interactions with hostile residents. So for example, people who were more digitally confident, so for those who were living in, in Waltham Forest who were much more independent, um, they still needed assistance from their, their key workers um, to uh, get tasks achieved for them, like getting a personal independence payment going through, like they needed someone to help walk them through the process and the steps of that. They couldn't, they didn't feel confident doing that in the, that kind of high risk thing, high stakes task independently, or even bidding for housing is a very high stakes task um, for people uh, living in hostels and they would want key worker support for that. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, people with much lower confidence levels, like a lot of our um, residents that we spoke to in Camden who had um, just transitioned from mostly rough sleeping situations, um, were tended to be much less digitally confident. Um, but when probed, they, they could do certain things online, like, go on social media, interact, like uh, passively kind of interact on 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 um, platforms like Twitter. But when it came to, as I mentioned, when it came to more of those kind of high stakes things like closing down a bank account, doing your online banking, even things like online shopping, creating a creating an account, um, that dealt with with something as high stakes as money um, was something that they consistently were going to key workers for support for because they didn't didn't necessarily have the confidence to um, know that that high stakes task was was kind of going to go right for them. Um, so that was something that was very very interesting and, and and so what the so what we have there is how might we help provide different levels of support for different needs along the spectrum so that spectrum that i kind of mentioned in digital confidence level um and and one of the things we kind of maybe potentially want to probe into are there any examples of overcoming this um from from elsewhere as we go forward um 
Next slide, yeah, perfect. Uh, so um, our next finding is that Wi-Fi means freedom to pursue my goals from the immediate and basic needs to more ambitious and long-term goals. So what what we mean by that is Wi-Fi is inherently almost um, almost like a baseline. So what we observed is that people in temporary accommodation don't always have the time or headspace to focus on those ambitious long-term goals. That might be because of dependence or because of the mental state they're in. Um, so they need Wi-Fi in their rooms where they can pursue those kind of more ambitious long-term goals in their own time. So what we mean by that is there were quite a few people, um, everyone we observed actually, who um, because they're in um, a, a situation that has made them slightly more vulnerable, they're very focused on like, what is the next immediate task that I need to overcome? So with one of our hostel residents, as you see here from this quote, his, um, at this moment, he, he had ended up in temporary accommodation because of, um, because of problems with, uh, with depression and his mental health. And one of his key goals was literally just to be in a stable environment where he can move forward um, with with mental health improvement and with his mental mental well being. And if he got his mental well being under control um, to a point where um, he felt comfortable and safe, then he would be able to move on from there. So his immediate goal was um, to wake up every morning, see how he feels mentally figure out if um, he was going to be able to go outside, what he would need to kind of prepare himself to do to go outside, um, or if he was feeling bad, just go easy on himself, um, learn some things online, try to kind of just focus on, on what that immediate goal was. Um, another person that we spoke to uh, was dealing with um, having a baby uh, for the first time, but not having Wi-Fi at home. So her immediate kind of needs or her immediate goal was to look look uh, after her dependent, um, make sure that uh, her kind of learning needs and development needs were being met, um, do the tasks that she needed to do online for work, and then um, from there, she could focus on those long-term things. Um, so it was really interesting going into Waltham Forest Hostel where Wi-Fi was not available, yet the people who were living there were much more um, techno digitally confident, but unable to actually pursue some of their digital, um, their digital needs because of the, not only the lack of Wi-Fi, but also the old building made getting data very, very difficult. Um, whereas when we were in Camden, we were, um, we, people were much less digitally confident, but had Wi-Fi available and they needed that assistance from key workers to kind of get their next task done. So a lot of them wanted to build on that digital confidence, but before they could build on that digital confidence, they were focusing on the next immediate task, which for some of them was get into independent living. For others, it was things like, we spoke with a, a man who had just lost his um, his best friend who uh, he was next of kin for. So his immediate goal was to um, make sure that all of the uh, his bank accounts were wrapped up and um, he could focus on the funeral. And then once he got that done, it was on to the next kind of immediate task. And so people are, are not necessarily in the headspace always to do those kind of long term goals and they need. Um, but Wi-Fi at least allows them to have the freedom to pursue those long-term goals when they do get into the headspace of that. Um, and then the so what there is, how might we provide fast, reliable Wi-Fi in people's rooms so that people don't spend their limited money on data, go elsewhere at a great cost, or don't move forward with their goals at all? Uh, next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so 
uh, as we mentioned as well, uh, Wi-Fi helps people travel beyond their current environment. So it provides entertainment, it provides learning, and this can be key for mental well-being and development of that resident and their family. Um, so essentially Wi-Fi is fundamental in putting residents in po positive mental well-being and positive headspace required to move on. Um, so as you can see from this quote, uh, one of our residents used um, used his own data and internet for research and learning. He really loved to learn. Um, and so when he uh, when he did have that spare time, he was able to use his at the moment he was using his data to do that learning. Um, one of the other residents we spoke to um, was uh, uh, had, a, had a baby and she was very frustrated because at the moment she was only able to let her daughter watch certain things um, whereas she had uh, she had this Disney app but and she wanted to connect it to her TV and unfortunately the app needed Wi-Fi to connect to the TV um, and so she couldn't do it through her data plan and so if she wanted her daughter to watch things um, she could these things that she wanted them to or her daughter to watch for kind of developmental and learning purposes the only way she could do it was on her phone which had a severely cracked screen as well and so she didn't feel comfortable with her daughter watching watching on this um this device uh so it was very frustrating for her that she couldn't almost provide for her daughter in this sense because of the lack of wi-fi um so on that on that note, our, our so what is the same as as the one before. How might we provide fast, reliable Wi-Fi in people's rooms for people at different stages of their current journey um, to create that mindset that allows people to move on, not just those who are proactively trying to complete ta the tasks needed to move on. Um, and then our final uh, finding that we have is Wi-Fi is a vital part of people's lives, especially for digital natives. It, it is um, essentially that, that lifeline in a way. So people expect it to be fast and reliable that um, to allow them to do those everyday things they need. If not, even those with very limited funds may buy data bundles to ensure that they have it, but data doesn't work for everything. Um, so, one of our our residents that we spoke to um, said that he got a new phone specifically so that he can do the things he needed with it here. Um, he got a TV as well um, so that and and was literally kind of spending um, a large portion of his um, of the money that he did have available to him to to make sure that he had those things um, that that would support him, um, those digital things. Uh, and then um, multiple people we spoke to actually had kind of a, a, a monitor at a TV screen as their desktop um, and had kind of set up their rooms in a way um, that allowed them to kind of use it as a multi-purpose tool. Um, so how might we provide fast, reliable Wi-Fi in people's rooms so that people don't spend money on data even when they can't afford it um, or go elsewhere at a great cost? So we had one resident who was traveling to the library with her six month old baby or traveling to her friend's houses um, to get to get kind of fast Wi-Fi when she was there um, and, and really struggled with that. Um, and or just not not if they don't have that Wi-Fi, they're not necessarily able to move forward with those those goals they have at all. Um, so those are our current kind of immediate findings that we had off off the back of our our initial sessions. Um, and so what we'd like to do is uh, if you can go to the next slide, Ganta, um, just collect some of your your feedback on those initial insights. So Courtney, would you be able to, actually I can do it, post this link. Oh yes, Courtney's already there, she's on it. Um, if you could go into the chat and Courtney's posted a link to the retro board that I have up on the screen here. And um, on that, 
you will be able to leave some of the um, initial kind of uh, thoughts and feelings that you have uh, based on what we've shown you so far. So the questions that we've put up for you are, which of the findings that we've uh, we've brought to your attention here really resonate with you? I know there's quite a few people from different councils and different boroughs on this call. So one of the questions we have is, what is different on your borough, if anything? Um, our third question is, are there any other issues we, uh, you think that we should consider related to the understanding of digital inclusion that we haven't brought up today? And then do you have any other thoughts and comments? Um, Sandeep, if, if there are any other people that are having these issues, please feel free to leave your comments in the chat instead, um, and we will make sure that uh, we include those. And we'll give you five minutes of quiet time to, uh, to add. Thank you.
I see that people are still adding, so I'll just give one more minute. Um, so get in any of your kind of last comments in. And uh, I mean, this will also be open afterwards, so feel free to keep adding to it. All right, I'm gonna open up the floor here. I think initially some of, I'm I'm finding this really, really interesting. So thank you everyone for adding, adding things in. And I think a lot of, there's quite a few things that are resonating with me that we didn't even have the chance to mention. So for, for example, like the things like training and digital skills is really, really interesting as well. And I think that ties into one of the, one of the um, insights or the findings, observations that we saw um, within Camden, for example, they had invested in in getting a, a seven week long kind of digital skills um, training program that that wasn't actually well attended, which they were very surprised about seeing as tech issues and tech skills came up um, quite regularly and quite often. Um, and I think a lot of in in surveys they had done, and I think a lot of that also ties into um, that that finding that um, people are very concerned in the as and when of um, their their kind of immediate needs, and sometimes don't necessarily have the capacity to focus on those those more longer term. Um, like learning goals. So one of the questions that's coming up for me is how might we provide um, training for digital skills that um, that assists people who are very focused on um, on getting their kind of immediate needs met um, and may not have the the capacity to do something more focused on longer term learning abilities. Um, but that's just something based on on what we're seeing come in here that I think is really interesting. Um, in the last fi uh, 15 minutes, though, it would be great to to open it up to you and um, yeah, and kind of get a get the discussion rolling in terms of questions or comments that you have. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anyone that would like to share either what they've written down here or or other things that are on their minds based on what we've what we've shown shown to you so far please feel free to take yourself off mute you can raise your hand if you would like or um just start speaking up um well i can speak a little bit of my situation um i'm a care leader so um like regarding like hostels um accommodations um i feel that it's, it's very hard because um i don't really know how to explain it but basically like for me for my situation as a care leaver is that i have to basically wait till 21 to get any sort of help even to get accommodated with hostels and um i feel in general with hostels um getting that support is very hard because at the moment you're having to go through assessments and um 
also like sometimes trying to get referrals and you have to either be with organization and if you're not with organization that can be 10 times harder for you and then obviously in general then you're being told you might have to go through private and even with that that's um, a struggle because if you don't have a guarantor or you don't have that type of help then how are you getting that support That's great. Thank you for sharing. Does then, does anyone want to address? I mean, it would be interesting, Latrice, maybe to hear about how, um, how you think, uh, like digital support would help you in that situation. Well, I work, so it is really important for me to be stable and to be able to be somewhere where I have Wi-Fi that is running smoothly and that um has good signal etc and that everyone is is able to basically use it type of thing because i know sometimes in hostels um they have wi-fi but it doesn't always stretch and then also they might have a wi-fi box and everyone has to take it so yeah it makes it hard and then everyone is kind of having to like buy their own own dongle or their own type of you know like they are etc and so forth and then yeah and then i know in certain in certain hostels um safe wise um there has been like incidents where like people have like been able to get into other people's rooms type of thing and even with staff and people's stuff have gone missing mm. so in general stuff like that like safeguarding is really important yeah that's really useful thank you for sharing um tun rio I don't know if I'm saying your name right. I'm very sorry if I'm not, but I see your hand up. No problem. Hi, guys. My name's Tavaria Martins from Southwark Council, and I work in the digital tool team at the moment. And we're actually running a small pilot for um, care leavers and people in temporary accommodation. So what we've done is bought and hired small um, broadband routers. Um, and we're working on a bit of a referral basis where we ask the um, the temporary accommodation managers and the care leavers service to refer people that might benefit from um, having a broadband router um, wherever they live and basically we've sort of um, added the routers as an item in the libraries so um, care leavers and people in temporary accommodation can go to the library pick up a router for free and basically loan it out for a month and then at the end of the month if they do want to renew it they can and we've sort of done that as a ongoing um so there's no basically there's no real end date to there's no limit on how long they can borrow it for and we the intention is for it to be a sort of short-term solution because you know um and it sort of links back to what was said in the beginning is it people-based solution or a place-based solution and I think around this pilot we're looking at short-term solutions to help people the most so we kind of think that by giving the router to the individual that needs it they'll be able to benefit from it the most and um, I'm not from the temporary accommodation service so I'm not exactly 100% sure on the fluidity of um, living circumstances but the the idea is that you know if for whatever reason they might have to leave temporary accommodation and move elsewhere they can take their broadband router with them and they've always got that internet connection regardless of you know where they are um so um so yeah i just wanted to give a bit of feedback on what we've got going on on at Southwark. that's really great that's really really interesting and i think um if there's any other kind of it like impactful projects that are going on in other councils please feel free to to leave that in either contact any of us uh, will we'll, um based or i think our information is on the invite or you can leave it in the kind of thoughts or comments section in that link um because those are the types of uh the types of projects that we would really really like to hear about and see if we can um if, if we can kind of project them mm. up councils. Um, Shakira, I see your hand up as well. Hi, nice to speak to you guys. Um, so my experience is, is a bit similar to, to Latrice's. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like where I am is like 
the Wi-Fi only works downstairs. And sometimes it's like when you're doing your meetings and stuff like that, like people walk in and out and it can get quite noisy and it can just distract you. Um, where I live as well, it's like you can't even, um, where I live, it's like you can't even actually get a router because I actually tried to like buy a router for um, my little flat here and there's no like telephone line if that makes sense and there's no like nowhere to plug these things in so it's it's made it more difficult for me to actually attend work meetings because I, most of the time I do it on my phone or I have to use my hotspot from my phone to connect to my laptop and the connection isn't always as good as a router would be if that makes sense um so that can affect me in a way where like for example I'm on a zero hour contract at work and it's like traveling to and from work that's like three pound ten which isn't it doesn't seem like it's a lot but when you're not making a lot of money do you get what I mean yeah like true. just traveling to work alone that is difficult so nine times out of ten I end up walking to work because I can't afford to get the bus so mm. it's like I'm always left in like a cycle if that makes sense or what do I stay at home and just struggle with the with the rubbish wi-fi or do I actually make an effort to keep going to work if that makes sense to make sure I go to my meetings and stuff so I feel like accommodations like this should have wi-fi that reaches up to the top floor because I, I live in an accommodation that has five floors do you get what I mean so um yeah I feel like that's a big issue um it was um, the same a little in my place as well that i was living in um mine was a shared accommodation three bedrooms but because i was on the top floor the wi-fi was quite quite crap but my connection was still all right but i know that yeah. it's worse worse than like hostels and um living obviously in high buildings and you're on the top floor mm-hmm. and then there's yeah. only wi-fi at the bottom floor <laughs> I think, I think that's a really good point as well that like a lot of the buildings don't even have spaces to even be able to get your own router your own wi-fi installed um so these are really great points thank you thank you for sharing shakira and latrice that's really really interesting um useful for us Uh, I'm just wondering, are there any final, before we wrap up, just because I know we only have three minutes, is there any final kind of questions we'd like addressed you'd like to bring up? Mm -hmm. Um, Rachel or Genta, would you like to kind of... It's Sophie, I think. Oh, is it Sophie? Sorry. (laughs) That's all right. Cool, thanks, Genter. Um, Yeah, so um, basically just before we close today, I'm just going to take you through what's next for the project. Um, So, yeah, so we're going to continue with the hostel visit. So we're um, interviewing hostel managers and residents. Um, Next week, um, we'll be publishing a survey as well. So it's just giving TA, TA hostel commissioners, managers, heads of service that we haven't spoken to already the opportunity to still share their um, own experiences as well. Um, and then once the hostel visits are complete, um, that's when we'll start synthesising the insights um, and create a discovery report of the findings. So just sort of echoing what Gillian said, what we shared today are the really early findings. Um, and then it's once those everything's complete, that's when we'll produce the, the good report. Um, And then to share those findings, so to discuss them in more detail, we'll be holding a second show and tell um, probably towards the end of November. We've not confirmed the date just yet. Um, So what I suggest is um, if you'd like to join our base camp space, um, that's probably the best way to keep up to date um, with the project. And as soon as we have confirmed the date for the next show and tell, um, we'll put a link on there. Um, I'll put a link to the space in the chat. Oh. Courtney, you've already done it. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> um, and also, um, if not today, next week, we'll upload the slides um, to the Lottie website as well. So in case you can't note down the links now, you'll be able to get them there too. Um, yes, I think that's everything. So I guess to fully wrap up, 
Um, just like to say a really big thank you to everyone who's joined us today, provided their feedback and, um, and come off mute to share your experiences as well. It's been really, really useful. Thank you.